So in the last lecture on the issue of Melchizedek and the sacrifice of the Mass, uh, specifically we were discussing the issue of um, the biblical and uh, theological arguments uh, concerning this issue. And of course this is important because this is uh, no doubt one of the key doctrines within uh, Roman Catholicism, right? Is this issue of the So the issue that we need to um, be taking care of in this second lecture, that I'm going to be discussing, okay, I'm glad you asked how, specifically, um, did the Church Fathers agree with the Roman Catholic teaching concerning the Messiah? Um, and I'm going to be examining five of them, uh, many of, some of which are cited by Robert Bellarmine, who is the main Roman Catholic um, scholar and theologian, he was a cardinal. Uh, advisor to Pope Clement V, I think, or Pope Clement V or the sixth, but one of those two, if I remember correctly. Um, and he cites many of the fathers in his section on Melchizedek in his treatise on the Mass. And so the first one is uh, Clement of Alexandria, then Cyprian, Eusebius of Caesarea, the church historian, Ambrose of Milan, Jerome, and St. Augustine. So first is uh, Clement of Alexandria. And, uh, the, and the passage that is cited is from Book 4 of his Stromata, Chapter 25. So Stromata, Book 4, Chapter 25, Clement of Alexandria. And he says, quote, This is in reality righteousness, not to desire other things, but to be entirely the consecrated temple of the Lord. Righteousness is peace of life in a well-conditioned state, to which the Lord dismissed her when he said, Depart in peace. Mark 5.34 For Salem is, by interpretation, peace, in which our Savior is enrolled king, as Moses says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who gave bread and wine, furnishing consecrated food for a type of the Eucharist. And Melchizedek is interpreted righteous king, and the name is a synonym for righteousness and peace. Now, like I said in the previous lecture, uh, just because, uh, the just, even if we were to grant that the Melchizedekian or that Melchizedek offering bread and wine, giving bread and, or bringing forth bread and wine, uh, is a type of the Eucharist. This would not prove the Roman Catholic view, uh, simply because the Roman Catholic view of the Mass is that it is a propitiatory sacrifice, uh, and this is not necessitated by um, Melchizedek, because I think that it would be a big stretch to say that Melchizedek's quote-unquote sacrifice was propitiatory. I, I haven't found any Roman Catholic who would grant that assumption. But that, was, that is basically what you would need to grant um, if you are willing to push this typology. Uh, but that does not work. And even if we were to go even further and say it is that Melchizedek did offer a bread and wine as a sacrifice, which I argued against in my last article or last lecture based on an article on my blog, of course. Uh, even if we were to grant that, that still would not prove the Roman Catholic view because... Uh, there's a sense in which we allow that the Eucharist may be called a sacrifice. Sacrifices of praise, thanksgiving, memorial, remembrance, those sorts of things. Um, we grant that completely. I would recommend people read uh, the section in Jerome Zanchius' commentary. Uh, I believe it's on the Pauline Epistles where he says this exact thing, that we Protestants will grant that there's a sense in which the Eucharist can indeed be referred to as a, quote, sacrifice. But now... Um, Notice that Clement of Alexandria says that Melchizedek gave bread and wine. He does not, Clement does not say that Melchizedek offered up or sacrificed bread and wine, which that's ultimately the interpretation of this passage needed for the uh, Roman argument to have any merit. So basically, two things. Number one, he says Melchizedek gave bread and wine. He doesn't say he offered it up as a sacrifice. And second of all, this is the main point, even if we were to, even if we did grant that Melchizedek um, was bringing forth bread and wine as a type of the Eucharist. This does not prove the doctrine of Rome's Mass. <clears throat> now, the second father is uh, Cyprian, and it's his letter to Caecilius, Epistle 62 of Cyprian. And Cyprian says, quote, Also in the priest Melchizedek we see prefigured the sacrament of the sacrifice of the Lord, according to what divine scripture testifies and says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Genesis 14, verse 18. Now, he was a priest of the Most High God and blessed Abraham, and that Melchizedek bore a type of Christ, the Holy Spirit declares in the Psalms, saying from the person of the Father to the Son, 
Before the morning star I begot you, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, which order is assuredly this coming from that sacrifice and this descending, that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God, and that he offered bread and wine, and that he blessed Abraham. For who is more of a priest of the Most High God than our Lord Jesus Christ, who offered a sacrifice to God the Father, and offered that very same thing which Melchizedek offered, that is, bread and wine, to wit, his body and blood? Now, um, though the fathers were holy men, they were not infallible. It would seem, and I would postulate that I think it's possible that Cyprian was contradicting himself here. Because he elsewhere teaches against transubstantiation, which is, of course, a doctrine which must be true in order for the sacrifice of the Mass to make any sense. Uh, there's a passage where Cyprian says, For because Christ bore us all, and that he also bore our sins, we see that in the water is understood in the pe understood the people, but in the wine is showed the blood of Christ. So here Cyprian basically seems to say that in the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist, the relationship between the sign and the thing signified is the same. And yet I have not found anyone, including Roman Catholics or Lutherans or Eastern Orthodox or Assyrian Church of the East, no one, who has said that uh, there's a transubstantiation in water, that water it, or um, that there's a change of substance in the water to the thing that it signifies with the accidents of water only remaining. I have not found anyone who says that, and I don't think, and if, is, if, if we press that into Cyprian here, he can't be teaching transubstantiation. But regardless, with the passage at hand, um, yet again, as I've said before, uh, just because Cyprian refers to the Eucharist as a sacrifice does not mean that he uh, interpreted that in the same way that the Council of Trent did in the 16th century. Um, again, and this is a key point in this whole discussion, that just because the Eucharist is called a sacrifice by one church father or is interpreted in such a way does not itself necessitate the Roman Catholic view because it can be... The Eucharist can be a sacrifice, and I would say is a sacrifice of remembrance, thanksgiving, and um, a memorial. So I don't, and I don't know anyone, um, and I would say that it is not a propitiatory sacrifice. I got a little tongue tied there, excuse me. Now, the next um, church father, if we might call him a church father due to some of his slightly semi Arian tendencies, is Eusebius of Caesarea, the great church historian. And obviously that's the work he's most known for, but he wrote some other works, uh, The Life of Constantine. But he wrote a work called The Demonstration of the Gospel, which was a defense of Christianity. And in Book 5, Chapter 3, uh, Eusebius says this, and this is the passage that is cited by Roman Catholic apologists to prove their view on the Mass and Melchizedek. So, uh, Eusebius excuse me, says this, quote, Since then Christ neither entered on his priesthood in time, nor sprang from the priestly tribe, nor was anointed with prepared and outward oil, nor will ever reach the end of his priesthood, nor will be established only for the Jews, but for all nations. For all these reasons, he is rightly said to have forsaken after Aaron's type and to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now that alone kind of proves what we said in our last lecture, that the respects in which Christ is a type of, or excuse me, in which Melchizedek is a type of Christ and Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek is in respect to things like not having genealogy, having an eternal priesthood, not being just for Jews, but for everyone. This is, this is similar to what we were saying in our last lecture. And that's exactly what Eusebius is saying here. So he continues on. Eusebius says, And the fulfillment of the oracle is truly wondrous. The one who recognizes how our Savior Jesus, the Christ of God, even now performs through his ministers today in sacrifices after the manner of Melchizedek's. For just as he, who was priest of the Gentiles, is not represented as offering outward sacrifice, but as blessing Abraham only with bread and wine, and exactly the same way our Lord and Savior himself first, and then all his priests among nations, perform the spiritual sacrifice according to the customs of the church, and with wine and bread darkly express the mysteries of his body and saving blood. This by the Holy Spirit Melchizedek foresaw, and used the figures of what was to come, as the scripture of Moses witnesses when it says, quote, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God, and he blessed Abraham. And thus it followed that only to him with the addition of an oath. The Lord God swore and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So I, I would respond by noting the following things. First of all, uh, Eusebius says that the Christian priesthood is spiritual. Um, and thus, the sacrifice would be spiritual as well, which contradicts transubstantiation. Um, it's Which is exactly what classical... Uh, reform scholasticism as postulated when it comes to the issue of the nature of Christ's presence in the Eucharist, which is a spiritual presence, not a substantial 
uh, and literally physical one. Plus, Eusebius says that, uh, that the elements represent the body and blood of Christ. He does not say that they literally are. But the point that I want to uh, really emphasize is that in book one of this same treatise, uh, Eusebius says this, which really does militate against the Roman Catholic interpretation. And speaking of the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist, he says, and after, uh, or excuse me, I'll start a little earlier for, for context's sake. Since then, according to the witness of the prophets, the great and precious ransom has been found for Jews and Greeks alike, the propitiation for the whole world, the life given for the life of all men, the pure offering for every stain and sin, the Lamb of God, the holy sheep dear to God, the Lamb that was foretold, by whose inspired and mystic teaching all we Gentiles have procured the forgiveness of our former sins, and such Jews as hope in him are freed from the curse of Moses, daily celebrating his memorial, the remembrance of his body and blood. And after all this, when he had offered such a wondrous offering and choice victim to the Father, and sacrificed for the salvation of us all. This is what Eusebius says. He's, Eusebius says, quote, He, Jesus, delivered a memorial to us to offer to God continually instead of a sacrifice. That is, Demonstration of the Gospel, Book 1, Chapter 10, for the citation, if you want to look it up. So that, is, that alone is, is quite interesting. He says, Eusebius says Christ gave us a memorial instead of a sacrifice. So that, that militates, like I said earlier, it militates against the Roman Catholic interpretation. <clears throat> so, um, first of all, the next uh, thing is Ambrose of Milan. Um, and so there are many uh, Roman Catholic apologists who uh, cite a, um, an alleged treatise with, written by Ambrose, allegedly, which is what we're going to get to in a second, called On the Sacraments. Um, but this is actually pseudo-Ambrosian work. This was not actually written by Ambrose. And uh, the society which reprinted and published this work in the 19th century, or it was in the 19th or 20th century, they themselves said this, that this was not, um, that this is not actually written by Ambrose. Um, and I and I cover that in one of my other articles, and uh, Lord willing, I can put a link to that article in the description where I cite the exact source where they say that this treatise was not written by St. Ambrose of Milan. Now, um, Eric Ibarra, he's a Roman Catholic apologist, uh, well-known, uh, especially for his work on the papacy and church history, but he's also done some stuff on the sacrifice of the Mass. He published a book uh, within a year ago on this subject. Uh, and it's from Ambrose's work on the mysteries, which is indeed authentic. And uh, and it says this. It says, so lest anyone should say this, we will take great pains to prove, this is Ambrose speaking, to prove that the sacraments of the church are both more ancient than those of the synagogue and more excellent than the manna. The lesson of Genesis just read shows that they are more ancient for the synagogue took its origin from the law of, Mo of Moses. But Abraham was far earlier, who after conquering the enemy and recovering his own nephew, as he was enjoying his victory, was met by Melchizedek, who brought forth those things which Abraham reverently received. It was not Abraham who brought them forth, but Melchizedek, who was introduced without father, without mother, having neither beginning of days nor ending, but like the Son of God, of whom Paul says to the Hebrews, that he remains a priest forever, who in the Latin version is called King of Righteousness and King of Peace. Do you recognize who that is? Can a man be King of Righteousness when he himself can hardly be righteous? Can he be King of Peace when he can hardly be peaceable? He it is who is without mother, according to his Godhead, for he was begotten of God the Father, of one substance with the Father, without a father, according to his incarnation, for he was born of a virgin, having neither beginning nor end, for he is the beginning and end of all things, the first and the last. The sacrament, then, which he received is the gift not of man, but of God, brought forth by him who blessed Abraham, the father of faith, whose grace and, whose grace and deeds we admire. We have proved the sacraments of the church to be the more ancient, now recognize that they are superior, in very truth, it is a marvelous thing that God rained manna on the fathers and fed them with daily food from heaven, so that it is said, So man ate angels' food. But yet all those who ate that food died in the wilderness, but the food which you receive, that living bread which has come down from heaven, furnishes the substance of eternal life. And whosoever shall eat of this bread shall never die, and it is the body of Christ. Now, I think in that last sentence there, um, he's speaking about Christ himself, not the sacrament of the Eucharist necessarily. Uh, that is plausible because he says the bread shall never die in it. The bread is the body of Christ, uh, speaking in a figurative sense. Um, but of course, in this whole passage, uh, this passage does not address uh, the issue of the sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, Ambrose does not say anything like that here. Um, and he himself quotes the passage and says, Melchizedek brought forth these things. He does not say that he offered them up as a sacrifice. 
And again, as we said before, that even if he did say that, that would not prove the Roman Catholic view. Uh, the next father is Jerome. And in uh, letter 46, Jerome says this. He says, turn back to Genesis, and you will find that this was the city over which Melchizedek held sway, the king of Salem, who, as a type of Christ, offered to Abraham bread and wine, and even then consecrated the mystery which Christians consecrate in the body and blood of the Savior. I respond by making the same point I made above about the bread and wine of Melchizedek as a type of the Lord's Supper, namely that this does not in of itself prove the Roman Catholic view. Uh, however, nonetheless, <clears throat> um, later on in, uh, in Jerome's commentary on Matthew, Book 4, chapter 26, he says, quote, After the type had been fulfilled by the uh, Passover celebration, and he had eaten the flesh of the lamb with his apostles, he takes bread, which strengthens the heart of man, and goes on to the true sacrament of the Passover, so that just as Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, and prefiguring him, made bread and wine an offering, he too makes himself manifest in the reality of his own body and blood. So Jerome does not indeed say here that the bread and wine offered by Melchizedek was a sacrifice, um, and again, I would respectfully disagree with Jerome here because of the arguments I made in my last lecture. Jerome was not infallible. Uh, none of the fathers were infallible, though they were no doubt holy men used by God to defend the church against heresy and, uh, you know, schism and things like that. Uh, but again, just because the sacrifice of Melchizedek may be, be uh, may be indeed a sacrifice, and we grant that point, that does not prove the Roman Catholic view because the Roman Catholic view insists that it is a propitiatory sacrifice. Now, the final father is the great St. Augustine, um, arguably the best father of uh, the Western Church. And so in um, City of God, Book 16, Chapter 22, City of God, Book 16, Chapter 22, Melchizedek, uh, or excuse me, St. Augustine says, quote, He was then openly blessed by Melchizedek, who was priest of God Most High, about whom many and great things are written in the epistle which is inscribed to the Hebrews, which most say is by the Apostle Paul, though some deny this. For then first appeared the sacrifice which is now offered to God by Christians in the whole wide world. Yet Augustine elsewhere, in his reply to Faustus the Manichae in Book 20, Chapter 18, says, The Hebrews again in their animal sacrifices, which they offer to God in many very forms, suitably to the significance of the institution, typified the sacrifice offered by Christ. He says this sacrifice is also commemorated by Christians and the sacred offering and, particip and participation of the body and blood of Christ. So he clearly says here that the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the one sacrifice of Christ. He speaks of the sacrifice. So Augustine teaches that there's one sacrifice of Christ which is remembered by Christians in the celebration of the Eucharist. He does not say that it was the same sacrifice offered again in an unbloody manner, which is the teaching of the Council of Trent in session 22. So that will conclude uh, this particular lecture uh, regarding the Church Fathers' beliefs when it comes to the issue of Melchizedek and the Mass, which is a key Roman Catholic argument concerning this doctrine. Uh, I hope you, that uh, you, edif you were edified by this. Um, I pray that uh, this perhaps would help anyone who's struggling with these issues to be, help to be able to better answer these questions. Um, I would recommend, uh, I have some, I'll put a link to the article upon which this lecture is based in the description below and also that article I talked about earlier which goes on to the issue of whether or not the treatise on the sacraments was written by Ambrose of Milan or by someone else. And of course, uh, the latter view is the one which is held by those who published this very treatise in the 19th or 20th century.